Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending. It's good to see so many people here. Um, I'm not going to do anything. I'm actually going to make a chair this because this is their uh, function. Uh, today's um, discussion is about the MA landscape and levels of activity in the UK shop broken and the MJ market. So, obviously, it's been very good. We're not actually having any slides, but we are recording. So please, if you have any burning questions, you can ask them, but if you can hold them back to the end of the presentation, that would be really good. And then please identify yourself in the snake, you know, just tell them what's it. Um, I was going to say phones, please can you turn them to silent? <laughs> Thank you, uh, for respect to the gentleman. So uh, I'm going to hand that Paul. The stage is yours, sir. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, should be a really interesting um, debate today. Um, so, just quickly introduce the panel. We've got Mark and David from KPMG, and then we've got Xavier from Living Bridge. Um, what we thought we would cover off were four broad topics. So, firstly, Mark's going to give us an overview of the market. Zav is going to talk to us about what he looks it looks for from a PE perspective in the insurance market, um, MJs in particular. Um, we're going to have a little bit of commentary about what you might be doing to prepare for sale, if that's in anybody's plans, um, but 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 fairly generic, and then. David is going to give us um, his views, the outlook for 2020 and beyond. So, good structure there. We've got about an hour, um, and I think we would, if people have got burning questions when we're going through it, or something that they think that it really is the appropriate time to ask it, raise your hand, um, uh, and we'll take it. We, we can take questions during the process, but at the end, we're going to sit and have a, what's hopefully a really good debate covering some of the um, topics. So, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm at uh, Mills and Reeve um, Lawyers. We're doing quite a lot of work in the MJ space, so um, they asked me to chair it. Um, I've got the easy job uh, across the mark. I've got the difficult job to <laughs> kick it all off. So yeah, I'm Mark Flenner. So I'm. Uh, I head up the financial services m &A practice for KPMG in the UK. been doing insurance deals for about 25 years. <coughs> I know I don't look old enough, but that's fine. Um, let me give you a quick overview um, of what's going on. Some really important themes, I think, to pick out. One is that um, there is no shortage of money coming into this market. So there's an oversupply of capital at the moment, hunting for distribution businesses. I'll use the word distribution to cover both broking and MGA, just so everyone's clear. So there's lots of capital looking for a home. Uh, there is a proven thesis that um, putting businesses together through a buy and build creates value for shareholders. And that has happened over the last 10 years, and that's what's attracting the capital. There is a, uh, a desire that either niche and or size makes a big difference in terms of getting access to capital, debt, <coughs> or good underwriting capacity. So those things are really driving it. On the other side, you've got a scarcity of opportunity. So there's not as many available, in inverted commas, businesses um, able to transact with that capital. Um, and <coughs> there is a desire to build out specialty, whatever specialty means. Um, so you've got this interesting <coughs> battle between excess capital and lack of opportunity. And, and as I'm sure the themes will come out um, over the next hour, that's had a material impact on the price of the businesses that people are buying and paying for. So that's had quite a significant um, uptick from perhaps where we were if we were doing this a few years ago. So prices have gone up. Um, 
I think the other big themes that we're seeing is that uh, underwriting performance in certain segments is pretty good. Um, and therefore, if you're a buyer of businesses, when you're looking at underwriting performance for why are you doing that? You're looking that for the longevity of the cash flows that are coming out of the business. Um, you get a nice big tick, not in every single line of businesses, but across most lines of businesses. Um, so that's that's also an interesting factor. Um, so people are making money not only just out of their distribution income, but some people, if they have that in their business model, uh, are making money out of profit commissions or similar like structures. What else is happening? I think we're seeing um, a development on who's who wants to play in the market. So I think that's quite interesting perhaps for this debate. So you've got private equity who love this space. You've got private equity that is now coming in from the US. So I think, you know, we'll probably have one eye politically <coughs> on what's going on at the macro level, perhaps that David will cover off a bit later. But clearly the price of an asset in sterling is very different to the price in dollars at the moment. So we're seeing a lot of inbound coming from the US, names that perhaps we've not heard of before or seen active in the marketplace. I think that's an interesting thing just to consider because there are cultural differences perhaps we can pick up in the Q&A as well. Um, you are getting buy and build platforms that will be sold over the next 12 or 24 months and the big ones and they will change hands and that will create a whole new wave of um, M&A activity, either the platform will stay together and we will acquire more and bigger businesses, or people will naturally come out and go again and start up. So you've seen new names coming, so you know, GRP, PIB, Ardonna, et cetera. They're all evolving their business models and size along with who owns them. So I'd expect that to continue as well. So those are the sort of really big themes that we're seeing. So Capital, people, scarcity, price uh, are real big themes that are happening. Um, I don't want to go deep at all into regulation and stuff like that. It's always there in the world that we occupy. Um, it, it's not a, I don't see a, a huge headwind there on the regulatory side that will fundamentally stop what we're all talking about. Okay. Excellent. No, very good. Um, so that sort of sets the scene as to what the general market's like. Um, Zab, can you give us a, an insight into how you see it from your particular seat there with private equity? <coughs> yeah, sure. So Mark alluded to there being no shortage of capital. So kind of, I am that capital. Um, Not all of it. Just <laughs> We've, we've got ambitions. So <laughs> just a couple of minutes on Living Bridge. So we, we're a mid-market private equity fund manager. So we manage about 2.1 billion sterling for institutional investors only. So some of the same investors who invest in the insurance market. So American pension funds, insurance companies, family offices, that sort of thing. And we're looking to deploy that predominantly into the UK mid-market. Um, the difficulty with there being excess capital in the market is we still want to make a return. That's what we're paid to do. So in a world where prices are getting higher, actually for any kind of business, they're particularly getting high for insurance distribution businesses, that poses a challenge because as, you know, as long as they keep going up, then we're all laughing, right? But they might not. There might be things that cause that cycle to reverse or at least flatten off. So my job is to find the businesses that I really feel we can invest in and make a difference and build something really valuable because fundamentally our job is about, the way I see it anyway, it's about building awesome businesses. It's not about looking at a spreadsheet and seeing if I can get this number in cell A1 to grow by 15% per annum, then we'll make a return because kind of we're not that sort of capital. We work with 
real businesses, real people who are looking to build something really interesting. So if, if I apply that thinking to the insurance market specifically, I guess what that means for me is a business that takes somebody else's product and just ships it on to a customer without doing much in the middle is not that interesting because it's quite hard for me to formulate my hypothesis about why this business is valuable today and why it's going to grow over the next few years. And it needs to do that in order to deliver a return to my investors. Um, what is really interesting, and I, this is why I think the MGA space, or the you know, agency generally, I'm, I'm not too hung up on kind of the specific regulatory criteria that people fall into, but businesses that look at the insurance market as quite old fashioned and quite inefficient and big, the big markets are really interesting. I'd say there's a better way of doing this. And I guess a lot of you in this room fit into this, fit into this box, be able to say, we can devise products that really deliver something useful and valuable to the end client, and it delivers an underwriting return to the capital that we're drawing on. That's a great starting point for a really interesting business because you look across the insurance market as a whole and it's really quite a lot of dull businesses that have been around for a very long time doing things in the same way that they've done them for the last hundred years. So the opportunity to be a disruptor in this market, you don't need to be that disruptive, just being a little bit better and a little bit more on it enables really significant uh, value growth potential. So that that's kind of how, how we look at life generally. And is there anything is there anything in that when you're looking to differentiate businesses, are you looking at is it tech driven? Is it you know is it is, is, is it just the quality of the management teams doing doing something a bit better than the than anybody else? Is there any is there anything particular in there? So it, so it's all of the above really. I mean, a business with no technology it annoys me a bit when people talk about tech businesses because you know all businesses use technology to, or should do to some extent or other and yeah, the ones yeah. that don't are going to be toast that doesn't mean we're back in the year 1999 where you know if you weren't an internet you know everyone talks about internet businesses no one talks about internet businesses anymore because everyone's got a website everyone deals online, they buy things online, they sell things online. It's just a channel to market. And technology that enables a business to do what it's, you know, a business needs to decide what it does. Once you've decided what you do and what that value add is, you have to figure out an efficient and effective way of delivering that service. And that's where technology comes in. Yeah. So we spend a lot of time understanding what that tech roadmap is, but it's from the point of view of how the product is going to develop and how the service offering a yeah. value proposition to a business's customer. And actually for MGA, you've got two customers. Effectively, you've got the bloke who buys the insurance at that side, and you've got the pension fund or the ILS or the reinsurer or whatever that provides capital. That then and you have to have a proposition that works for both of those. And if you're not clear about that, making decisions about the business and what you need to do is so much harder. And that kind of flows into the management question, really. So if a business is going to be a leading business in its sector, you need to build the best management team in the sector. We sometimes invest in businesses that have the best management team in the sector across the board. Normally, there's some team development, actually, working with the team to figure out what, what the blockers are, what their ambitions are, and what additional hires they might need to make in order to deliver on those ambitions is a kind of fundamental part of what we do. Yeah. Um, we're typically the first institutional investor into a business. So these conversations are often quite new, but we've the conversation we've had 150 times. So it, it, can, it needs to be scary. What we need to have is the ambition that you really want to make something special and then we can work together to kind of figure out how that works. So that's sort of how we, so that's a stream of yeah, consciousness yeah. really, that's how we think about um, 
what makes an investable business. Yeah. It's, you know, big enough market, because there has to be the opportunity. Yeah. A business that that kind of knows its own knows its own mind, knows what its offering is, and then a team with the ambition to really make something of that is a you know they're a great ingredient for private yeah. equity investment yeah. for, for us and for lots of other people like us. <coughs> and just just picking up on the tech point, I think you know I, I like your comments about technology. I think in in the MGA space, the the tech question is a slightly different one. It's more about the data that sits around the underwriting and the ability to analyze that data to understand the underwriting and the price better. So I think where, where good MGAs stand out is their ability to capture multiple data points, interrogate that data and pop it back into the underwriting question. And, and you do see that, you see a lot, a lot of people now spending a lot more time on where is the data enrichment coming from? Um, God forbid we talk about actuaries, but you know you got actuaries involved, those sorts of things. Um, so that that's more about where the tech's going. There are certain MGAs as we've seen, um, and travellers can attest to um, that if you get a segment that naturally lends itself to being online and you can put it online efficiently then people will pay a a very high <coughs> price to do that because you're almost leaping forward in time to do that and i would draw a parallel actually with my industry so the way we raise funds is great as long as you can do it so we get commitments for money from pension funds for 10 years and those pension funds pay us fee before we've invested a penny and what they're really doing is backing the institution that I'm a partner in as a platform to deliver in a replicable fashion deal after deal over a, over a multi-year period and in order to build the credibility to be able to secure those commitments from really high quality institutions you need to demonstrate a track record and you need to demonstrate that you have the ingredients within your own business, which includes technology, includes people and specialist skills and distribution networks that make them comfortable that we will be able to deploy their capital in a way that's going to make money. If I'm looking at an MGA, I'm asking the same questions. So I can look at underwriting performance today and underwriting performance over the past few years, and it's really important from a sustainability perspective to see that actually this is a business that can create a product that the customer wants, but also is profitable for the underwriter. But I, I also need to see that there's something in the DNA of the business or the way it operates, its methodologies, that will enable it to continue to do that despite competition. Yep. If, yep. if you see good margins being made in a sector, that typically attracts new people. And if you look at the MG, you'll know stats. I imagine there are more NGAs now and people holding the pen for capital than there were 10 years ago and more than there were 20 years ago. And you know, for you not to be on the wrong side of that squeeze, you need to be really focused on what it is you do well and keep striving to do more of that. And if you can demonstrate that, then that's a really investable proposition. And it's, it's interesting, this data point, you know, just anecdotally, <laughs> we've seen one of our clients that the uh, they've massively improved the loss ratios over yeah. a two-year period by sitting down with actuaries and really working out what they were doing wrong yeah. in the process. So um, I'm not sure they enjoyed that process no. very much, but they've <laughs> sure enjoyed the outcome right. from yeah. that. But that's around that data yeah, point, yeah. isn't it? You know, I think yeah. it, is, it is really important. I think when you come on to preparing business sales, it comes into that. So yeah. Interesting point around having two clients and actually being, having, being able to look at your UMI, your UMI management information in a way um, that shows that actually you understand the profitability of your underlying book um, and are able to manipulate that in order to make management decisions is really important. Yeah. So I think that if we look across InsureTech and inverted commas, um, a lot of the sort of effort and innovation has been at the front end. So how do we how do we get out to customers and how do we win new business, which obviously is the right thing, but I think not losing sight of how do we actually look at the back office and mid office of our operations so that we're making the right decisions um, and we know we are because we've got the data. 
before we go on to just talking about getting ready for business, I just thought it might be it might just be worth talking about the some of the buy and build platforms that you were mentioning, Mike. So you you know you, some of the large players have been out there. That's not your space, say, or is it Living Bridge? You're 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 more interested in more of a niche business, more of a, a, a you, you might add something to that business, but you're not you're not looking at going out and doing so a series so, of acquisitions because so, I just think for this for this audience it's, it's interesting to sort of think where where the NGA exit might be you know is is it actually you are developing your own business to a point <coughs> where um, someone's just going to invest in that business and help that business grow or actually is the route more with more of the consolidation that, that we're seeing so, so as a as a fund we do both so we have made over the past 25 years about 150 what we would call primary acquisitions or platform acquisitions like the first deal and then we've made a similar number of add-on acquisitions for those um, businesses we invested in so some have made no acquisitions the, the highest number we invested in a dental chain called Portman we made 50 acquisitions over four years um, so it's very much depends on the strategy of the management team and what that strategy is they want us to back. Um, in the insurance market, if I give a couple of examples where we have invested, so we invested in a business called Kingsbridge about, what, seven, eight years ago, which um, provides contractor insurance. So I don't think, Mark will probably know the answer, I don't think technically they were an MGA, no. but they designed their product um, which was a great product for contractors, they had great distribution, and what it meant was the guy going on the oil rig, the BP, could show his piece of paper that said, I've got all the insurance that I need. It was well priced, yet still profitable for the underwriter. Um, that was a, I think you just call that a niche business that operated in a niche that was big enough to achieve growth, and we ended up um, selling that business after three or four years, um, backing the management team to do a secondary private equity transaction with another private equity house, which often happens because if you've built a business well enough for it to deliver growth and have a platform that can cope with more growth and is well positioned in a, in a good market, there will always be another financial investor who's interested in that. And that provides options to the management team. Another um, deals. I didn't actually work on the Kingsbridge deal, but a deal I led was um, into a group we now call Genston. So you, know, you might know that better as Covershaw and Policy Fast. Um, and the Covershaw bit of the business, the franchise network of SME focused insurance brokers. Um, and we are acquiring small books of business uh, to put within the franchise network. We're also acquiring schemes and affinities business. So we bought a motor trade focused schemes business called the Delphi last year and we've got a decent handful of other larger acquisitions that we're looking at and the idea there is we want to build a really meaningful force in the world of SME insurance. P possibly almost a bit of an antidote to a GLP or mm. certainly in the minds of sellers this is a place where SME brokers can come and get support mm. to deliver their proposition to their customer base. Um, would we do a deal that was pure buy and build, replicating what GMP have done? We, we would if the right team and the right opportunity came up. Um, the thing I'd need to be persuaded of was that kind of that time hadn't passed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think if you if you look at who the players are, go back to in my opening comments you, you have you have distribution businesses that have been set up by the founders growing nicely tapping a good niche but need growth capital they need more money to invest buy extra teams buy new kit whatever it might be maybe de-risk a little bit then you're into predominantly the world of of xavier and his peer group which is the what we call the primary buyer um, 
you don't have to do that. You can clearly go and become part of one of the sectors consolidators who have a proven strategy of buy and build. You will come into the fold, you will sit here, you will do this, you will do that, and give you a little bit of autonomy to do this. Um, it really depends on you as owners, what your motivations are and what you want to do. If you want to get access to more capital, then the private equity world is a great way of doing it. Don't forget GRP, PIB, Ardonna, Giles, you know, all few people around the around the room who know it well, but you know, that's that's the proven route that they've taken, the private equity route. It's helped them grow their businesses, it's helped them make money, um, and help make money for the investors as well. So that's a that's a really proven route. Mm -hmm. And then you have on the other side, which we have seen increasingly, Marsh, Aon. Gallagher's, to a lesser extent, JLT before it went in, as also a proven route to sell your business too. Not everybody likes that because they go, well, you know, I was there 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. That's the whole reason why I, I left that institution to start. So you've got, you've got a multitude of exit opportunities, but it really depends on motivation and, and need for access to cash yeah yeah yeah, yeah no agree and some people have found just in defense of some of the consolidators for a moment is that some people have found actually going into one of those businesses as a leader of a business that they've acquired they've made me the leader of a much bigger part of their empire yeah, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes you're running a, a, a specialty or a geography or whatever it may be, or they both with their feet and say, right, so we'll go start again, reload. You know, all of the names I've just mentioned have all actually reloaded and started again. So it's a very dynamic, fluid market where capital comes in and goes out. And I think the... The, the understanding of what you're doing in those two is slightly different as well, isn't it? You know, you're, it's much clearer what you're doing in the consolidation routes. They'll set out quite clearly what they want you to do, and, and they've got their own business plan that you're following alongside them, aren't they? Yeah. Whereas the route you're talking about, Xavier, is much more about, well, management team will sell their business plan and what they would like to do, to a PE backer who will back that particular plan and that particular route. And the two, and the two, you know, the, 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 there's significant differences between those two. Yeah, I mean, what, what fundamentally what private equity does is enable a business, this is when it goes right, it doesn't always go right, even the living bridge. <laughs> but when it goes right, you enable a business to achieve what that business should really go on to achieve and you enable the shareholders and stakeholders to achieve what they want to do. And sometimes their point is <coughs> parallel lines and all that the stakeholders need is capital, for example, to make acquisitions. Sometimes you've got a founder who's reached the age of 65 and he or she says, well, I want to retire, what am I going to do? Um, and sometimes you're a bit before that, but the founders can, set, can kind of see they maybe need some help in taking the business on to the to the next level, in maybe European expansion, or it might be acquisitions they've never done before, or it might be some strategic shift. They want some help, and they can see a time when they might want to exit the business, and they can't really see a path towards achieving that. So what yeah. what the flexibility of private equity as a funding route does is just throws all those options up in the air and enables us to have a discussion about so what are all the things, what's my menu of things I'd like to achieve, and we can try and figure out how we do it, rather than do you want to sell all of your shares to Aon, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. And the answer, uh, probably with the price is big enough, yes, I'll do it, but it doesn't quite hit those other criteria. And I think it was just, it was interesting to bring that out because I think one of the things I see quite a lot is 
uh, and, and actually particularly in this in, in insurance market because it's such it's a market where everybody knows each other and very well connected and there's lots of conversations about <clears throat> private equity and buying build and what it actually means and I, and I think the, the, the thing that Xavier and Mark have done there is you, is you, you need to look at it more uh, objectively as to what's you know what's the purpose behind those two models and then you then the role you've got in those two models once you've done the deal should be a bit clearer um, right before we uh, go too much more into that um, some tips then from the panel as to what things you should be looking to do if you're preparing for sale or looking to sell looking to sell I think the point of so we mentioned the <coughs> of succession. Um, so understanding how the how the relationships in your business are spread amongst your, amongst your staff before you consider an exit. So what's the next level of management down and um, beneath, beneath you as the founder shareholder? So how, how, how does that work? And be really clear on your messaging beforehand and preparing that. Um, I think that, that's absolutely key. I think in terms of in terms of whether it's private equity or trade. Um, there's obviously dozens of private equity backed and consolidated out there that we've already mentioned. Um, and I think private equity as a whole, even those who aren't already in the sector, buyers are going to look more sophisticated in regards to insurance. They understand the understand ins and outs of it. Um, and so I think being able to present management information in a way that uh, justifies the, the, right, the right of your business to exist. So if income's gone up, is that because you've sold more product? Or is it because rates are hardened? Um, what's the underlying you know, what's the underlying profitability of that book? So what's the capacity provider thinking about um, in terms of the, the results you've been delivering for them over time, as opposed to just um, going going to market maybe for the best? So I think film preparation is, is really really key to get it right. It's interesting that management team point and the succession point, isn't it? I mean, again, that's something we often see is. Um, there's a, there's a sort of a general view as to who needs to be incentivized as part of these deals and which members of the management team need to be part of that. And I think that that's something that the earlier that process is crystallized, the better. Because again, it's about it's about going to your buyer and saying, these are the key people, yeah. this is the team we want. You know, if you get into a process where they start to form a different view, or you haven't thought it through properly, again, that's, you know, it's not just giving the right messages where, as I've said before, management and the people fundamentally are your, your primary, you know, that's sort of number one in the box, isn't it? Or, or, or pretty close to there. Um, I'll, I'll say the, the question that helps to frame all of this stuff, actually, that I would always start with is what does success look like? What, what do I actually want to achieve? And you'd be surprised by how many businesses who have appointed less august advisors than uh, KPMG who come to market and it becomes <coughs> quite clear they haven't really had a proper honest discussion, maybe even with themselves, about what they want to achieve. So do they, you know, do they want to sell a business? Do they want investment? Do they want to retain a state with it? And if you can't clarify that thinking, it's pretty hard to clarify thinking on things like succession because it's quite important to know, you know do I want the successor for me in five years' time or in ten years' time or actually tomorrow? They, they, they would indicate different courses of action. And having thought through properly, you know, what, what is the deal I would be happy with enables you to then focus on what are the things that need to be true in order for me to achieve that goal? Um, and some of that's getting the financial information presented, you know, making it easy for a buyer to actually see what it is that they want to see. But a lot of it's what, what's going to be important for all of these people who make this business tick and make sure those needs are addressed appropriately. And that just makes a deal much, much easier to do. Yeah. And I think particularly where particularly where you are going looking for a PE investor, again that's but that's particularly you've got to have that thought through and understood because because the reality of um, of private equity is you will see a lot of opportunities across your desk. And it's and there there is a process of making sure that you get the attention that you want 
with that proposition, isn't it? And, and, and the minute things are missing from that, it's easier for that to be overlooked for something else. Yeah, yeah you, you don't want to go into uh, bringing on board a new investor or a new shareholder half cocked. What, what tends to happen is you think you're really well prepared, and it's not until the other side come in and start asking significant, difficult questions that you realise, crikey, we, we're playing catch up here because they're just looking at our data in a different way. They're looking at our cost base in a different way. They're looking at our insurer relationships in a very different way. And that's the challenge bit. So sometimes before a process even starts, you need a challenge session with your advisors and your management team as to how are people going to look at me and be prepared that way. Xavier's right, we see so many times people say, right, well, you know, here's a set of accounts and here's our <coughs> broker pitch pack that we normally give. You know, why, why don't you want to buy me? Why, why can't we get it done by the end of the month? You know, these processes take a huge amount of time. And if you're with a private equity proposition, you know, if, if we're doing a deal with Xavier, you know, we're talking about legal diligence, financial diligence, tax diligence, insurance <coughs> diligence, commercial diligence, what's going on in each of the key subsectors that you're specialists in? What's the dynamics there? What's the long-term, medium-term outlook in, you know, FinPro? What's happening in trade credit? What's happening in whatever the subsector might be? And there'll be separate project teams focused on those areas, all reporting back to Xavier and his team saying, well, we're a bit worried about this sector because it's doing this, this, this and that. And then they'll come back to you and say, right, can you stress test that vertical for me? And you'll go, okay, well, we've, we've never really looked at stress testing that before. How do we do it? So the, it, it, it's quite an involved process um, that, you know, will take a lot of management time, no matter how you look at it. Management will get sucked into presentations, preparation, <coughs> dry running, what does success look like? What do we want? What do we want out of this? I think on the investment side, so let's say if you're selling out to, to a trade player, I think answering the blunt question of what are we going to do with the money? So if, someone, if money's no object, what do you do tomorrow? It's a great business. And having that really dispassionate conversation with yourself and saying, well, what, what actually, what are the growth opportunities for the business today? And what actually could we do if we just you know, um, took the handbrake off and, and went for it? And I think doing that thoroughly up front and, and really kicking the tires on that before you start is really important because you, know, you don't want to be in a, in a situation where someone's offering you a great opportunity and you just haven't, you know, you haven't done the thinking at a time. And, and what about timing then? What's your what's your best time? Is there a best time for the? You know, is it? Are you are you trying to make sure you're you're at that you're at that part of a growth stage? Are you you know? Is there is there anything particular for the audience to sort of think about there? I think I can, I, can I add a question. Yeah, Mark can answer. So I'd, I'd be fascinated to know. So yeah. pricing yeah. in the price of businesses in the insurance market has been, I would say, quite high for quite a number of years. <clears throat> and it, based on a couple of recent deals, seems to be getting even higher. Yeah. It, have we have we reached There's some good peak? news, audience? Mm -hmm. well, well, have we reached a peak? <laughs> Is it going to keep going up? Is there going to be a crash? Will Will Brexit cause a whole resetting of the dial? What? Okay, so so let me cover off those two questions. I'll leave a little bit of the second one for for Dave to cover give, off. Give me Brexit. On, yeah, give me Brexit. Um, when's the best time? The best time is when when you're ready. So there's no. There's no, I have to create this amount of profit or that amount of profit or have that type of account. It's when you're ready. Because when you're ready, it means you'll sell your business properly. Because you'll be bought into that process. So I, you know, when I'm advising clients, it's right, are you really ready to do this? Because if you're ready, then we'll do it. If you're not ready, then let's wait and we'll get ready. Yeah, and that can take a variety of forms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pricing, 
I'm going to ignore the big macro binary stuff for the moment. Pricing is going up. Pricing is going up. Go back to what I said in my opening comments. There is huge amounts of excess investment capital coming into this market. There is a proven precedent out there <coughs> that people are making money in particularly the London and the UK segment of insurance distribution. Until that stops, you'll have no change to the pricing. Pricing is going to go up. Why? Because the bigger platforms with new money will have more money to go out and buy it. <coughs> and they're all competing for a finite number of experts. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a simple supply and demand type issue there. What, what we are seeing, what Dave and I are seeing a little more is that the, the national or sector consolidation is continuing, but the slightly larger businesses are taking investment capital to develop their businesses outside of the UK. So I think Hyperion have done this quite well in the London market. I would expect some of the national consolidators to be looking up and looking onto the continent, assuming no great macro issue, um, very shortly as well. You've seen London private equity firms go into the Benelux quite considerably. Um, Ireland, there's a lot going on in Ireland at the moment. So I think you will see people look away from from an English consolidation play into maybe a, a pan UK or um, a northern continental European opportunity. David, just I'm conscious we would like some questions. So could you just give us a I know Mark's probably tried to eat into what you're saying there a little bit. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it, 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 it's probably the logical time just to finish that off. Yeah, so I think this sort of are we at peak valuation sort of question, I think probably leads into sort of the outlook. So the 2.5 trillion dollars of dry powder at the moment. So money that's been raised by funds to be deployed. So then, then you look at you look at to the, to the debt markets, and actually at the moment debt's readily available. It's, it's as cheap as it's ever been. So those two factors are driving driving high valuations. Not no, not in isolation, but they're, they're big contributors to that. So tomorrow, given everything, all, all socio um, political uncertainty in the market at the moment, could that have an impact? Absolutely. But that capital has still got to find a home. I think. So I'm chip in, chip in on this, but I think um, if I'm a private equity investor, I'm looking at the various industries across which I invest, and I look at things like that are more correlated to capital markets, things like retail, and I look at insurance, and I look at insurance distribution, which you know, I've got stability of earnings, I've got good recurring revenues, I've got high cash conversion, which, which is always nice. Um, that sort of brings me back to why this is quite a good, quite a good home for that capital. You've also got, beyond the private equity firms, you've also got <coughs> pension funds um, coming in, starting to direct invest um, as they discourage from instances of pull out of the equity markets. Um, that's a trend we're continuing to see. We're seeing private equity partnering with pension funds, um, which brings different sort of costs of capital into the equation as well, so, um, which, which, is, which is quite interesting. So in the wake of all that, obviously, it sounds quite ominous given we've uh, in terms of buyout volumes, I think we're at the peak since 2007. Um, but notwithstanding all of that, I think ultimately, if, if, as long as as long as businesses are high quality and, they, and, they, and they've reached a certain scale, I think whilst we might potentially see some valuation come off, if, for example, um, in the wake of Brexit and other political uncertainty, um, you know, we start to see. You know, uh, a fall away in the value of the pound or people come out of the equity markets and, um, and, and there is uncertainty and um, certain um, sectors that our clients are playing in um, struggle. Um, I think if, if you've got a really, if, if you've got a really robust business model, I think that whilst we might see a dip, they'll hold some value. I think it's at the lower end where you've got some smaller businesses that maybe aren't differentiated um, and don't have the scale I think there we might see some of some of those businesses which at the moment are still commanding strong multiples, you know, up towards double digits. I think that will be that will be challenged quite strongly, I would suggest. 
Right. No, very good. Okay. Well, it'll be great to have some questions. Have we got any anybody with anything they want to they want to ask straight away? What do you think the future is for entrepreneurially and sustainability of? Are you blue or red? <laughs> <laughs> or orange? Probably, uh, well, he's asking the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I, it's a very political question, unfortunately. And I think if we, I think it's highly likely that if we go red, then that will clearly come away. There is probably at some point in the future a realignment of um, those types of taxes, whether it's corporate taxes, whether it's entrepreneurial relief or inheritance tax planning. And you can see, you can clearly see that politically they will go in one direction if there's a change of job. So for what it's worth, this is not an official living bridge view, but my personal view, I think entrepreneurs' relief is at risk of whatever government um, is in. So if it's true that it's a risk, actually that's in the short term beneficial for my industry because it's another reason why someone might want to do a deal this year rather than next year. Um, but I think there's legitimate questions about whether it's right that people pay 10% tax on a 10 million pound gain when the, the, the working man or woman is paying tax at a significantly higher rate. And I don't think that question is going to go away. Whatever the legitimacy of the reasons for those arrangements having been put in place. Um, however, if I look at the vast majority of the deals that we've done over the last 25 years, that's been done because of a lifestyle change or a requirement, some injection of something, and it's normally not money, it's normally skills or talent or ambition or a de-risking event. Or it's, it's, I can't think of any example of a transaction that's happened where the key driver has been for an entrepreneur to capitalize on a favorable rate of tax. Now that might have been in the mix, but that's just, you know, that, I don't think that's what typically drives entrepreneurs. It certainly wouldn't be brilliant for me to see the only reason someone is talking to me is because they've got this tax rate and they think it's going to change. I'd, I'd be wanting to scratch beneath the surface of that and say, yeah, yeah, but tell me, tell me about the deal. Yeah. I'm not going to throw it. Um, you talked a lot about the UK regional market, what's going on there. Do you have any commentary or um, on the activity in London market or other European markets or markets further afield? That's what you're saying. Yeah, so um, so we're, we're certainly seeing the Benelux and, and, and very much the Dutch and the Belgian side of that um, starting to pick up where the UK was perhaps 10 years ago. So they're starting to consolidate some of the regional players into reasonable sized businesses at the moment. We've seen a few of them come over to London to um, test some of that with uh, advisors and capital to see whether that's a, a similar consolidation play and platform that, that would get backing over here. Um, we've seen... Um, Certainly professional capital remain somewhat skeptical about their ability to uh, do that within the French and the German markets. Yeah. However much they'd love to be able to do it, it's a really big, big, big challenge to be able to do it. Um, and that's really where the activity has been. I think people have looked over the pond in the US and seen what's gone on there. And that has a direct parallel to what's going on here, obviously different scale, but similar, similar dynamics, highly fragmented professional capital helping do it. Um, so I would expect perhaps some of the uh, Northern European countries to pick up on the tails of that slowly, slowly. I think also, where London and the UK players are looking at is, particularly on the continent, 
where they're already accessing the London market, then it becomes even more of an interesting proposition. If it's a pure play in country domestic roll up, you have this conversation about where are the synergies, what do I get out of it? But if it's, you know, I, I've, I've got great capacity with an Amlin or a Hiscox in London, but I've also got that through Holland or Germany or wherever it is, then you can you can kind of get your head around it as a as an acquirer. And that's what people are looking for. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else with any burning? Sorry, David. Bearing in mind that quite a few of my clients in London have been struggling to find capacity over the last couple of years, and capacity has generally reduced. And further bearing in mind that income and MGA can be a bit lumpy because they expect quite a lot of it out of the profit commission is going to. And also that binders tend to have quite short termination provisions in them, I may so I disagree with. LMA precedents and things in that respect, but unfortunately a lot of us are pushed in that, that way. How does that impact on valuation of MJs? How do you get certainty of income? How does that Im impact on your investment view of an MGA business? Because you can say you're investing in that business and your binder might be pulled tomorrow. And you've got no capacity, no income and no business. How, 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 does, how do you go about valuing an MGA business in those circumstances? So, so for me, that'll go to the point I made earlier about how do I believe that this business is going to deliver in the future? It has the tools to deliver in the future what it has delivered in the past. So any business we look at, we consider what we call quality of earnings. So, so a annuitized income stream where there's no change of country, there's nothing that could change it, high quality of earnings, typically that sort of business um, isn't a growing business. The, the, the SaaS businesses we're seeing kind of emerge over the last few years is maybe is maybe a, a kind of break with that tradition. But typically, you've either got really stable utility type returns that you can value quite highly, but you're valuing for certainty rather than growth. If you've got an MGA that's exhibiting growth, but the lumpiness and there's contingency about future profits, then if I were preparing that business for sale, my overriding focus will be on demonstrating why those future earning streams are more certain than a skeptic might have you believe. So whether that's your underwriting expertise or the track record you've got in the past, or you know, so if you've got a relationship with an underwriter who you've made money for for the last 20 years and they can terminate your will. I'm much more likely to believe you won't be terminated at will, even if something goes a bit wrong, mm -hmm. than someone who's just brought on new capacity. So th there's a story, the picture you have to paint about <coughs> why this is a real business and not just a group of people who happen to be making some money this year. And that's that's kind of at the heart of what it means to be investable for me. Any, any thoughts from, from due diligence on your side on that? I think you know, on the sell side, it's just it's getting part of the underlying earnings to, to, to say this point. And so looking at the looking at the recurring recurring uh, recurring income stream and how and then on the profit commission, it's how aggressive or prudent are we being with regards to that? And then also working with working with vendors to prep and evidence that actually Notwithstanding how we recognise it, or, 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 or if there's been any lumpy less, um, just going back as far as we can and showing the track record, so evidencing that we have the lost data and we can um, give you confidence regarding regarding the forecast. A couple of big things from me, you know, I I look at it and say, right, okay, uh, you're struggling with the capacity on what line of business, and if you're the only market that's struggling with that line of business, then I've got an issue. So I will discount you. Yeah. If it's a market wide issue where capacity is leaving the market for that particular class of business, then I will I will discount it quite significantly. If it's if it's something where I think actually um, there's 
a one-off underwriting performance or whatever it is. It's quite nuanced, I think. Mm. But I think where, where investors are at the moment is saying, right, you have to bring capacity with you and you have to bring multi-year contracts with you if you can get it. And actually that's the same for in professional investors as well as trade. And the ability, particularly with what's going on at Lloyd's, for you to switch markets quickly, that's becoming more and more challenging. So staring into that, I like to see multi-year contracts. All right, there's going to be all the usual performance in there, but you know, you will get all things being equal, more value that way than you will an annual contract, notwithstanding some of the history. So it will depend where your market is. If it's all Lloyd's or not Lloyd's, will make a big difference. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think it'll help everybody in the room more yeah. than me, actually, but uh, just a question that keeps coming back to me, and I'll ask the question. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, but to put some numbers on it, <coughs> if you have a business that makes a million pound a year profit from the regular commission, but next year you're going to make five million pound profit commission, you hope, unless something bad happens, and then you're going to make a load of profit commission in subsequent years, are you going to sell that business off six million pounds profit? Yeah, you're probably not. So you're probably best, probably best waiting. If there's a one-off amount, maybe you structure a deal where you get paid for that profit commission as and when it comes through rather than getting it's a very specific dependent but some businesses are inherently more valuable than others and the nature of their p l is part of that so in thinking about how you how you build an mga business the more scale you've got and the more slice of the profit commission you've got over many years that that, that would look a much more smooth less Kind of less reliant on individual catastrophe risk um, sort of business. Yeah, but that tends to militate against nascent businesses yeah. doing anything until third or even fourth year. Now, because obviously PCs push back to four years. I'm seeing insurers pushing back, pushing back, and saying, hey, no, "We are going to stick with the LMA. We are going to have a one month termination provision at the back end of the year." And that just gives no certainty of pricing to anybody, no certainty of business model, I may say, to anybody. And, and that has been a general concern around the market. So I just wanted to know how it impacts on, on the M&A pricing from your point of view as well. That's a, that's a challenge of, of running and owning a new business in, in any sector. And the challenge really is the person on the outside is probably going to value that business less highly than the person on the inside who works 23 hours a day to get it going and they can see the future and it's all going to be fine and we talk to those people all the time you add up, mm -hmm. you add up the profit of all the business plans we see it doesn't add up to the profit of UK PLC it adds up to a lot more um, and that's you know, getting to a point where you can bring the external party to a similar mindset as you as business owner that, that's when you reach a point where there's a deal doable. Anybody else? Any other questions? Um, I had I just had one about this scarcity point, which I think is you know is inevitable where you see a lot of consolidation in, in a sector like this. How, how does that overlay or if you know the answer, does that how does that overlay specifically to this MGA space rather than sort of the wider broking and wider insurance space would be useful just to get a feel yeah. for that. The audience. MGAs of scale um, are very scarce in the UK, very scarce. Um, the ones that are not sat within much larger businesses. So you've got some consolidators and some of the alphabet brokers with their own in-house MGAs, so I'm ignoring those. So ones that are not aligned, anything of substantive scale is scarce. Um, How do you quantify scale? So, so if you set, if you look for an MGA that's got more than ten million in profit, you're, you're in, across the UK, you will struggle. If you look between five million and ten million, you'll still struggle. The bulk of the the bulk of the MGA world in profitability terms is in the naught to five million. And that's, that's actually another 
haven't really mentioned it, but another feature of valuation, and this is not insurance specific, this is across the market generally. If a business in sector A is worth 10 times EBITDA, if it's making three million pound profit, it's probably worth eight times. And if it's worth making 15 million pounds profit, it's probably worth 12 times. Um, and that's not necessarily because inherently the activities or the value add proposition of that business is any different. But bigger businesses are more resilient. They can, you know, a 12 million pound profit business can absorb a two million pound shock much better than a three million pound profit business can. And if you look at the history of the banks, you know, the banks with really well publicized but, but few exceptions don't lose money lending to big businesses, they lose money lending to small businesses, which is why there's a dearth of yep. funding for SMEs out there because they just go bust all the time. Yep. So that, that's a core part of the value play of all of these buy and bills is that big businesses are more valuable than small businesses, therefore you can buy cheaper than you than you sell for. Um, yeah. So there's more more capital yeah. is looking for the bigger, bigger businesses, businesses than is looking for the smaller businesses. Because the, they're the, better, better. the challenge for the smaller businesses is to have if if you're going into that consolidation route, is to have the scrap with the consolidator to get as much of their synergy on your side of the table as it goes on to their side. Because you know they they've got they've got a valuation arbitrage between what they buy you for and what the whole of their group is going to be valued at. So the fight really is about the the delta between those two points. How much of that you can keep as opposed to how much they want to keep. And that's really the, the negotiation boundary. Yeah, yeah, that's the key. That's one of the real key negotiating points where, where you're looking at someone who is going to sell at a higher multiple, yep. isn't it? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and to be fair, that is where, and this isn't this isn't an advisor promotion session, <laughs> but that is where I've seen, yep. certainly, yep. If, if, when your advisor, if your advisor knows what the, how ultimately that buyer will exit and, and, and where the opportunity is, that's where you can make some yep. gains, isn't it? So the whole conversation in the marketplace, certainly in the consolidator world, is pre and post synergy valuation for the target. So I might be talking with Zav about 12 times, but actually post synergy at six. So actually I'm a superhero because I've paid 12 because I know it's going to be six. And everyone goes, well, six times, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, because yeah. I've extracted all those synergies and and down. And, and. So there's just a different dynamic about how you look at valuation and how I look at valuation. Yeah. And I think even sellers who go through processes don't always understand they don't always understand the whole detail behind that. Right. Um, um, but yeah, yeah. And I suspect, I, su I suppose the point about the, just going back to that, um, what's out there in the MGA sector, well, if the consolidators can't consolidate at that level, then they will they will automatically look look to smaller MGAs, you know, they'll build their models around that. Yeah, yep. Yep. which is what they're trying to do. I think there are certain segments of the market that have struggled to have an MGA model in it. So the closer you get to retail, you know, tra traditional retail personal lines business, the harder it is to extract the, the MGA value out as yeah. well as the retail broker value. You know, we've, we've had it on, you know, working for our Donna, for example, you know, the, the actual mechanics and the economics of paying away and then having your MGA commission and then generating a profit for your underwriter on what is relatively commoditized business. Very, very difficult to make a living. Good. Well, first person's leaving. We managed to keep most of you for the hour, so that's not too bad. Um, we're, we're, we're about an hour now. So, uh, um, 
just to say, I hope that was interesting and, and you know, we covered some interesting topics there. Um, certainly, we'll be around for a bit. If people have, have some questions and want to talk about things, then, you know, feel free to do that. But uh, thank you very much for your time. And, and thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think it's fair to say that uh, those of us in the room who are looking to sell, the market is there. And if you're wanting to buy, you've got to have a quick word with Sally to get a check. <laughs> I think, as Mark said, the market is very, very fluid. And of course, there is money out there for expansion. And we're seeing a lot of that within the membership. And I think this entrepreneurial spirit within this sector is really going to show its place over the next three or five years. Certainly, moving into Europe. We know what Europe is saying with regard to if you want to trade in Europe, you have to have a license. We know that there's a great opportunity for us to trade in license Europe. But Paul, thank you so much for sharing this. Gentlemen, thank you once again. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen.